Hi, I'm Chris Chu from a School of Applied Engineering Physics from Cornell University. I'll talk about deep brain imaging. First motivation, the need for in vivo deep tissue imaging. If you look at here, the sagittal plane of a mouse brain is about one cubic centimeter, one centimeter long, probably eight millimeters deep. The yellow box and the red box are how much we can image in about 2005 and currently. You can see in 2005, we can only image a few hundred neurons, perhaps cross few hundred microns and, and about 500 microns deep. And now we can go much more, about a couple of millimeters deep and we can image maybe 100,000 neurons. But on the other hand, if you just look at the mouse brain, not even talk about human brain, we, can, we are still scratching the surface. So in some sense, our knowledge of the brain is very superficial is really because we couldn't see very deep. So it's really a no brainer. Every researcher wants deeper, wider, and a faster imaging technique. So why high resolution? Deep brain imaging is so hard. Tissue scattering really limits high spatial resolution optical imaging. Here, I put a diffuser, essentially lens paper, in front of my camera, my cell phone camera, and you can see light reach my camera. We couldn't see what's going on in this image. It's my office in Clark Hall at Cornell. You can see the big windows corresponding to this big blob of light. So even though you can still see light through diffuser, on the other hand, there's no high spatial resolution information left. Think about a mouse brain underneath a cranial window. So we take away the bone, put a piece of glass on the top, you really have to think about looking through a piece of tofu or a piece of cheese. It's very hard to imagine how you see a single neuron underneath a thick piece of tofu and a thick piece of cheese. The technology we use called multi-photon microscopy, it's still the best technique available today for deep tissue imaging in an intact brain. So why it works so well? It turns out if you want to go deep into thick scattering tissue, it's all about forming a sharp focus in 3D. As long as you can form a sharp focus, for example, I have a three-dimensionally confined fluorescent spot over here by the red arrow. You can see that as long as you have a sharp focus, you can do XYZ scan to form a three-dimensional image. In fact, it's all about excitation confinement. The emission wavelength has very small impact on how deep you can go. Again, the emphasis is as long as you can form a sharp focus, you can do three-dimensional scanning to form a three-dimensional image in a thick scattering tissue. How to form a sharp focus deep in the brain then? We use long wavelength, wavelength around 1100 nanometer to about 1800 nanometer to reduce the effect of tissue scattering. The physics is really the same as why the sky is blue and the sunset is red. So I'll skip the details. We also use three photon excitation to sharpen the focus. Let's see how did that happen? Three photon excitation to sharpen the focus. Many of you may have seen this. One photon excitation in a fluorescing cuvette, fluorescing dissolved in water. You can see one photon excitation not localized. In addition to the focal plane, have lots of fluorescence above and below the focus. For two photon excitation, you form a sharp spot, only the focus is bright. But on the other hand, if I pour milk into this fluorescing solution to make the solution scatter light, now you can see for two photon focus, quadratic intensity dependence, in addition to the bright focal spot, you also have lots of light coming up, almost similar to what you have in a one photon excitation case. You add a photon to it, go to three photon excitation, you can see only the focus is bright. Even in this highly scattering solution, the three photon excitation focal spot is very much like two photon excitation without scattering. And then we can also show just having long wavelength doesn't quite work for two photon. In addition to the focus, you have lots of fluorescence above the focus. So in that regard, three photon really sharpens the focus just like two photon does in a non-scattering tissue when compared to one photon excitation. Now we can do wonderful things once you can go deep with long wavelength and three photon approach. For example, here, 
we image all the way through the cortical column, through the wire matter, and all the way to the hippocampus of a mouse brain. You can see the wire matter going by, these are third harmonic generation. And then a little bit time, you can see the SP layer in the hippocampus of a mouse brain. It's a living, breathing, behaving mouse, right? And this is three dimensional reconstruction showing neurons and the purple is the harmonic generation of myelinated axons in the external capsule and the hippocampal layers underneath in the subcortical region. We can also now image uh, uh, capture neuronal activity. So I was jokingly saying that we can now watch mouse thinking very deeply, right? You can see the blinking, blinking of those neurons indicating neurons firing action potentials. Now we can also image through unthinned and intact mouse skull. So we don't have to remove the bone and put a piece of glass window. We can peel away the skin, but leave the bone completely intact. So you can see a movie showing you neuronal activity through the unthinned and intact skull. You can again see those G-camp label neurons firing action potential. You can watch this over multiple days and multiple weeks. And then we can also check spatial resolution. You can see for this neuronal process, we can see that the lateral resolution is about one micron. The axial resolution is about five microns. Certainly fine enough resolution to see a single neuron through as unthinned and intact mouse skull. And we can look at adult zebrafish. Zebrafish is the one of the favorite subject for neuroscientists. In this case, most people look at larva zebrafish, baby zebrafish. When the babies, when the zebrafish is very young, it's more or less transparent. But what about this fish joined to scale? It images through the cartilage, through the scale, and reach the brain underneath. And here shows you a adult zebrafish imaging, three months old, already reaching sexual maturity. Green are the neurons and Purple are the third harmonic generation. These are tiled together for this telecephalon area. We can essentially image from the surface of the telecephalon area all the way to the bottom of the telecephalon area through a intact fish. And this provides an exciting opportunity for imaging the developmental process of, a, of zebrafish from newborn all the way to adults. And infrastructure for long wave and three photon imaging is establishing at this point. For example, lasers are commercially available. In the beginning, we actually have to make our own laser to do three photon long wavelength imaging. Now you have at least six companies sell you lasers if you have the money. For example, before 2016, I say lasers for laser jocks, you still have a laser commercially available, but it's very difficult to use. 90% of the time, the laser is not working. For 10% of the time, it's working, you, gotta, you better take all your data. But now, we have much better laser. It's 90% of the time it's working, maybe 10% of the time it flakes out. On the other hand, a few years later, we can even better laser. It's more or less optimized for long wavelength three photon imaging, but you still have to pay about $250,000 for such a system. Long wavelength optics is also become standard for, from almost all laser companies or microscope companies. And you can see these are the first long wavelength microscope objectives we got in uh, 2011. And it cost me a price of a Porsche, but now you can buy the same objective for the price of a Honda Civic. And dozens of labs have already started three photon imaging and many labs are already achieving good results. So it's really, I think the market supplying the laser, the optics getting competitive and it will hopefully drive the performance up and the cost down. And just to show some other people's results from Rockefeller, Adi Pasha's lab, imaging deep and the volumetric, two photon imaging on the top, three photon imaging the bottom. From Peter So's lab, imaging the entire visual cortex all the way to the subplate. And this is the deepest blood vessel imaging in a living mouse, about 2.2 millimeters deep. And this is a miniature uh, three photon microscope mounted on a rat head so that the rat can jumping around behave itself while still being imaged see, to see its brain activity. This is the work done by uh, Allen Institute from Jack Waters lab, published in eNeuro just about last year. So a bunch of labs are already getting to uh, doing three photon microscopy. And we can help have broader impact beyond the brains. For example, we can image deep into the heart, work together done with Nozomi Nishimura at Cornell. 
we can image the entire lymph node. You can think about playing a essential role, a big role in immunology, perhaps, uh, imaging mouse spleen, very difficult organ to image deep in two photon is almost impossible to imaging uh, even beyond a couple hundred microns into the spleen, but we can image about 500 microns into the spleen. These results are now published to show you the promise of potential impact in areas beyond the brain. Now, of course, how to, about imaging deep, wide, big volume and image very fast. I think we're almost there. We're not, no one has demonstrated all this yet together, but we're almost there. And again, it's a no brainer because everybody wants imaging deeper, wider and faster. Show you large field of view imaging, not very deep from Carlos Sabota's lab in Genulia at the time. You can see imaging five millimeter by five millimeter field of view. And for some sub regions, you can see very high spatial resolution at a pretty high temporal resolution, seeing neuronal action potential. And we also have techniques now being published just last year from Jerome Wirtz lab about simultaneous imaging of multiple axial planes by the very clever method called reverberation multiphoton microscopy. You can see simultaneous imaging of multiple planes in a living mouse. So we can image very big field of view because imaging different Z stacks at the same time. You can also perform very high speed imaging by imaging the region of interest only by skipping the area you don't want to get information from. So only image the region of interest. By doing so, you can save your power and speed up the imaging process. This is a paper published a couple of years ago from Michael Lin's lab, together with Stefan uh, Denude, uh, showing very high speed imaging of voltage indicators, not only just seeing calcium response in the neuron, but also voltage response in the neuron. So much higher speed at about a kilohertz range. And very recently, we have also shown by imaging the region of interest only by using a new laser we developed called the adaptive laser. So we can capture individual red blood cells flying by in vivo at about 1.1 millimeters deep. So you can see taking at a 60 Hertz frame rate, you can see the capillary blood vessels in the hippocampus of the mouse. You can see those gaps in the blood vessel. These are indicating a red blood cells going by, excluding the plasma, which was labeled by uh, Texas Red. So you can see at that deep, we can still capture at about a 60 Hertz frame rate. Just to quickly summarize, the current funding for developing those techniques, mostly from Brain Initiative, and very recently, Chen Zuckerberg Initiative also uh, got into the game. Most of these grants fund for technology de development and dissemination and also fund technology applications to neuroscience. What are the gaps in the funding support? Current grants are typically too small to provide sufficient funding for instrument development integration. It'd be really nice to have funding support for centers for technology integration, development, and serving the community. It's almost like it's almost like a model based on telescopes. It's called tissue organ observatories. We combine all the best technology in one location and people can come and the best technologists can help pushing the frontiers of the boundaries of these imaging techniques. It's also a great way for developing interdisciplinary workforce. For example, biologists get to work with the cutting edge technology, the best technology available and technologists get to work with the cutting edge biological sciences. So technology can enable biology and biology can inspire future develop, further development technology. So with that, I thank you very much.